Okay, guys, welcome back to the Mario Man CD yeah. show. Yeah, boy, do we have a special guest for you today? Thank you man so much. In, <laughs> a man that was in the WWF as the Dublin Destroyer, Mr. Brian yes. Dunahoo, a man of Hello, many folks. How are you? How are you? Nice to see you both. Listen, I just want to say it's an honor and a privilege, and I mean that from the heart, to be with you guys tonight. And uh, Mario, uh, congratulations on the New England uh, Wrestling Hall of Fame and Paradise Alley, Mr. Roma, and all your your, your dealings. That's fabulous. And uh, Maurice, I mean, like we discussed a little before the show, uh, you have a big fan base here in the States, and you have people that before we even connected were telling me about your show. So, uh, yeah, kudos to both of you. Yeah, I man. think you're going to be you're going to be the face tonight, anyway. That's for sure. After comments like that, making us blush. No, no, no. I'm telling the truth. I'm telling the truth. Why don't you tell everyone what you've been up to since we last spoke, and then we'll kick it back because this guy's been working on some pretty big things, Mario. It was right. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I've been I've, I've been a film and uh, TV actor and stuntman um, uh, since um, before WWF, and then after WWF, I continued and laid some things into um, uh, some bigger and better projects as time went on. Um, I just got back, I was telling uh, Maurice, I just got back uh, prior to the holidays, right before Christmas. I was out in California working on the film Joker 2 for a month. And um, prior to that, before I left New York, I was working with um, De Niro and Bobby Cannavale on uh, Inappropriate Behavior, a feature coming out in October. And um, some various TV shows. And in between, Mario, I'm doing the real deal. I'm, I'm loading crates over at UPS for the benefits because that's how we do it. We just work. But anyway, yeah, I've been doing a few things. And um, things have been, um, knock on wood, things have been good. And um, and here we are tonight. Well, God bless you, man. That's a Thanks, lot. Brother. That's a lot. And we're old now. So that's a lot. Of, you're doing a lot there. Still banging around, still hitting it, still hitting the ground, you know. Yeah. I talked to Scott Wilder about going to California at the end of the month because nice he bushwhackers. Oh wow, yeah. yeah. Because it's mania week and he wants to go out there and, and do his thing, you know what I mean? Fabulous. And I'm just like, he's like, You wanna come? Come. I'm like, <laughs> nah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know what I mean? So it's like twenty years ago, yeah, let's go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we're going to be in, I, I think, Middletown, New Jersey in May. And then nice. you, get, you got Bruins thing in, in July. And, Great. You know, whatever else, Scott, I'll do Baltimore and stuff, but I don't, I don't, you know. A big travel? No. Right? Yeah. You know, my daughter lives in Prescott, Maine. I mean, I, I went there this past weekend, you know, take. Right. Because of the snowstorm, it took me 11, and a, 11 hours to get up there. It's 560 miles. God. So, and it took me eight and a half to get back on Sunday. And then you get up and go to work. I mean, you do that kind of stuff. And it, like yeah. the road is kind of like second nature to us anyway. Yeah, so, no, I got it. Yep, yep, yep. yep. It was uh, nothing jumping in a car or a van. Well, we used to grab the vans with um, Sonny Blaze and Chris Michaels and the crew, Mike Fiore. We used to jump in the vans. My wife was the only one that was halfway normal, so she would rent us one of those big, uh, with the captain's chairs vans and everything. We'd all pile in there and head up. Well, that's when I first saw you. And I'm going to I was telling Maurice before the show, before you came on, actually, that you were always, to me, a gentleman and very receptive and you had a lot of years under your belt at that point and i just wanted to tell you i respect that and i appreciate that uh, no, listen I, I you know it's it's like you know a friend i, I went to grammar school with known yep. for 46 years yeah gets a hold of me a couple of weeks ago says my daughter wants to be a pro wrestler oh yeah so they come into Paradise Alley, they sit down, but as they sit down, the wrestlers are coming in one by one. Yeah, yeah. And walking up to my buddy and their daughter and going, hi, I'm so-and-so. Hi, how are you? How are you? How are you? And he's kind of like thrown back a little bit because he, he he's like, "What? why are all these people coming in and shaking my... And I had explained to him that right. that's the etiquette of the business and yes. the respect and if you think there's respect in martial arts, it pales in comparison to pro wrestling. Yes, sir. So, you know, I never, 
Brian, I never, I never bought into the bullshit. I never bought into it. In, in fact, I still don't. Right. Big Daddy, Big Daddy yells at me all the time because of it. Okay. Yeah, Mario. Like I'm on a dating site, right? A couple of them. He's like, "You're the Undertaker's debut match, King Kong Bundy, Hercules Hernandez." Yeah. Yeah. Station. You're in the New England Pro yeah. Wrestling Fame, and you're you're on a dating site. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like I, I got you. I got you. I bought into the bullshit. So I was happy. I was always happy to be there, always. So when when guys came in, for one thing, when guys came in, I don't know if they were gonna. I was gonna see them for one night, or I was gonna see them again. Right. 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 So. You know, I was always very gracious and, and respectful to everybody that came in. I'd even try to give advice right, to, to people that are coming in. I even gave advice to Jimmy Helwig when he first came in. When I met him. Right. In Great. <clears throat> that was his first night there. Wow. And here I am, this little nothing. No, you were you no. See you, you 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 know what I find with you, which I think is appealing. I think Maurice will agree that you you um uh, uh in a good way are self deprecating. Like you've never given yourself a pat on the back. No, nah. never, never, nah. and you never did nah. then. And from <laughs> the interviews I've seen you doing with Maurice, you still don't. No, nah. which which is you know two thumbs up to you for that all nah. these years, and you haven't changed that mindset. No. Nah. That's fabulous. He, but he's still he's still my two highest viewed podcast on YouTube. Wow. <laughs> so and I've had a lot of I've had a lot of celebrities and porn stars and various different people on you know. and Mario is still hey, top. You know, Mario, you're killing the porn stars. Outstanding. June twenty first. I I'm expecting Nina Hartley. Oh, wow. I'm you know, anyway, so I'm looking Jimmy up and down. And, you know, at that point, he's still the dingo warrior. Shake his hand. I go, wow. You're built like a brick shit house. <laughs> he said, oh, my yeah. God. Yeah. I said, listen, when you go out there, don't sell anything. Right. Don't sell nothing. I said, it'd be like a flea on you. Don't register. Right. Don't even register. And forget about selling. Don't even register anything. Right. So he goes out there, whoever he's working with, the jobber hits him in the stomach and he registers. <laughs> and he comes back. And I look to the left. And and Pat Patterson's running down toward him like he's got a blue suit and red cape on. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I stand back and Jimmy turns around and Pat goes, hey, hey, hey. don't sell anything. Don't sell nothing. Jeez, I've heard that before. Yeah. He goes, don't sell a thing. And and Pat walked away and Jimmy went. And he looked at me. I went, Yeah. Don't don't sell anything. You know what I mean? So right, right. It's like Valentine's favorite story of when I broke in July 31st of 84 was my first match, and it was uh, in Poughkeepsie on TV with Valentine. And yep. I said, can I get a comeback? And he said, absolutely. I said, great. What can I do? He said, after you submit to the figure four, get up from the canvas and come back to the dressing room. And I went, okay. <laughs> yeah. Back so, into the locker uh, room. Yeah. But, right. but, but listen, you know, I always, I always um, rooted for everybody. Like pe people ask me about Barry Horowitz, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? You think he should be in the Hall of Fame, and I do think he should be in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, yeah. And I the the reason why I kind of slight myself is because you know when I walked in there, you know I was five ten, um, in bare feet, and you know five eleven and a half with an inch and a half half wedge on my yeah, and you know if people really ask us why we didn't go farther than what we did mm -hmm. is because we were in the land of the giants of course we're yeah. in the, but you were a big guy yeah you were a big guy so yeah. you know i always it, it you know and it really upsets me because and i think maurice likes me having on the on, on his podcast because uh, any podcasts uh, because I, you know, I'm pulling punches at all. No, so, good, good. 
as you know, Maurice, when, when Brian and I were in, um, you either were bloodborne or you were just out of the norm, so enormous and so huge that you were bigger than life. Right. Or you were gay. It, those were the three ways to get a break. So it, even if you got a guy that's talented like Brian, he's got the size, he's got the look, he's got the chops. If you if you dared put a microphone in, in front of him, he probably can cut a really good promo. Just never got the chance. Right. Because of those three factors. Right. You never, never got the chance. This is why, Maurice, when the other guys come up that were in our position mm -hmm. and saying Vince McMahon's going, hey, pal, come here. I'm like, what? What? I might have spoken you know, to Vince McMahon four times, four times in eight years. And, and one time was on Tuesday Night Titans. The other three were, you know what I mean? So, right. like... I, I I I watched what Maurice sent me today, and I got out. Either either I, I, which is not my norm to have a brain deficiency, but I remembered the last day I walked out of there. I made sure I remembered, and to my knowledge, my last day was there was April twenty sixth. 1992, and I worked with Rick Rude in Huntsville, Alabama. Yeah, the, yeah. Before that, I worked with the Honky Tonk Man in Nashville, Tennessee. Now, a fan fans will pop on here and go, "No, Mario, that match was with, in '91 with with Rick Rude. You're you you left in '91, and a, a lot of stats <laughs> say from '84 to '91." But my memory has me to 92. Now, the stuff I watched with you right. was after I left. Right. Right. So how long were you there for? I was uh, just shy of two. I was two, two years, say. So 91, 91 and two. You were there 91 and 92. Right. Correct. I remember you in the dressing room. I do. No, I, I used and to talk to you. I don't, Maurice, but I do remember. Yeah, him. no, I wasn't. Yeah, I, I'm, yeah. I mean, Only just, because of his hair. I remember, big listen, guy. Now, listen, my hair, my wife and I, I, I used to think, well, geez, these guys, you know, you got to have something different, something special. So I decided I'd go, instead of going to a professional and having them put a little color in there, lighten that hair up a little bit, whatever, I decided I'd get the stuff in the box from the stop and shop. And I said, but I didn't know, you know, so you're not supposed to do that three times in a week. So by the time I got my hair was almost green, it was blonde, it was purple, it was bad. Yeah, I had some shine. I had some shining locks yeah. back then, and I had the mullet going. Yeah, that's, so, that's it. And that was oh. it. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's yeah. How I and you were a big guy. Yeah, uh, you were a big guy. So, and, and you know, Strongbow brought me up in the business, and and Strongbow, Strongbow kept you humble. He yeah. kept you humble yeah. all the time. Yeah. So, um. You know, he was like my second dad. So, you know, I do remember you, though. But you were there. I was still there in 91. So you went 90, 91 to 92. 91 yeah. to 92. Yes. Because, at, like, as of 1994, the jobbers were gone. That had the whole dynamic of everything had changed, correct? Yeah. So, so in other words, the, the, the days of of us jumping in vans and cars and you guys coming up from Connecticut, us coming out of New York. And the, I mean, and, and we're not talking just driving down the street. We're talking about driving up to Canada and down South, you know, all over the place. Right. I mean, we were everywhere. everywhere. Every Pennsylvania. I mean, you got to know the waitresses names in the restaurants yeah. and the, you know, yeah. you, because you were there. It, it was like a rotation. You kept going and going oh. and we would travel, you know, I mean, a thousand miles. And it was not, like you said back then. It was nothing. We jump in that that car and just drive. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. Without a doubt, with, without a doubt. Um, sure. So that 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 was. Um, that, Brian, that's you should tell him. You should tell him the story about how you came up with the name the Dublin Destroyer. Mario would enjoy that story. Okay. I know you told it last time. 
but it's really yeah, good. Yeah, but you know what? My wife and I discussed it, and I I had said, talked about the tailor making the jacket and the whole thing. Then, but I'm going to tell you exactly what happened now because you know sometimes years get foggy. Anyway, as you know, we're going in, we're coming, we're working. You're getting that call. You're with the what two, three, four days, maybe three days generally, and you're you're in Erie. You're in. Um, you're going from Rochester, Utica, all those spots up to Maine. Then you do the Worcester Centrum, Springfield, all that. Uh, maybe Canada, you hit Ottawa, Conway. Well, we were, um, I believe, in um, Ottawa. And I was working the nightclubs then just to make a few extra dollars on the weekend here in Long Island, New York. And uh, these gentlemen uh, had a friend with them. And actually, he, he was kind of off by himself, but he was a tailor. And he said, well, I, I do some, um, you know, beautiful, you know, uh, clothing and this and that. He goes, and you're the guy, I've seen you on TV with the WWF, and I'd, I'd love to make you a jacket. And he goes, do you have a name? Well, my wife and I had discussed it for quite a while. And I, and I said, well, geez, you know, you don't, you know how it is. You don't give yourself a name. They're going to give you, they're going to give you what they're going to give you. And they're not going to broadcast it on their shows unless it's cleared with everyone. Well. I said to the gentleman, I said, well, the, you know, and I was going to pay him if he made me a jacket, whatever. I said, you know, it might be good to put a little flash in it. And um, I said, we were thinking, you know, you got the British Bulldog, um, you got Rowdy Roddy Piper, you got this with the, all these, these double consonant thing. And I said, well, Irish, I said, how about the, and my wife said, how about the Dublin Destroyer? And I said, that's got a ring to it. So I told this guy that. I said, the double. Well, I'm not thinking anything of it. We were just in conversation. Well, boom. All of a sudden, he brings a jacket like a week or so later. And I had uh, already booked to go up to Canada um, that during that week. And he brought this beautiful ring jacket. And I still have it in the closet here. And with the Dublin Destroyer on the back. So we actually put the name we said on the back. And... I'm up there and I'm literally in that. Now I don't I don't know if you were I don't think I don't think you were there then. I think you might have moved on, but it was um I'm in the ring and Mike McGirt is doing the announcing and she's and I I kind of covered, I kind of said uh, and she covered her mic and I said um before she announced me, I said, I'm the Dublin destroyer tonight. She went, I said, I said, and I turned and showed her the jacket. And she goes, is this cleared with Vince? Is this cleared? You know, is I didn't hear anything about this. I go, no. And, uh, I was going to say, yeah, yeah, you know, but I said, don't lie. I said, not really, but I said, I'm sure they'll love it. So she had them call it in, whatever, whoever she had to talk to. And all of a sudden she turned and she said, ladies and gentlemen, currently in the ring. And she looked at me and shook her head like, my God. Ladies and gentlemen, currently in the ring at six foot four, 285 pounds of crushing Irish power, the Dublin Destroyer. Oh, yeah. So they gave me that courtesy. They gave me that respect to let me have a name. And, you know, you, it was what it was. But you know what? For me, it worked. Because, I mean, I don't like to self-promote, and I never have. But, I mean, who, 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 would, who would ever promote themselves like this? I mean, Mario. Well, you got your own card there. Oh, I got my cards going. And, I mean, I'm not going to self-promote again, but this is you guys' show. But the guy, the Brian Donahue story, okay? It's yes, on I YouTube. sent that to Mario. Have you seen that, Maurice? Yeah. And, um, you know, a film group ran into me at a film festival and 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 they said, listen, you know, we'd love to maybe put together something, you know, a, a, maybe a documentary, a public interest, human interest type of five minute thing. It turned out to be a, um, a couple of year process. But uh, the director, E.J. McCleavy Fisher, put together this 20 minute documentary and it won awards at film festivals all over the country and it went international. So, you know, you never know where things are going to come from. And I did hear when you guys did a show and, and did see I, things stick out. And, and someone said uh, to you, someone asked you, Mr. Mancini, they said, um, 
well, you're on, you know, TV, but you lose, you lose. And you said to them, and I had that mindset from day one with them. Yeah, but I'm losing on the biggest promotion in the world. Yeah. You know, like I said, I started out, I was doing the small shows in the high schools and the the, the small little colleges and the different shows, you know, where the ring was half falling apart because it wasn't put together quite right. There was no pads. It was something. You're but horrible. I said, when I had the opportunity to go with WWF, I said, you know what? I said, I'm in. Because all of a sudden the lights hit and guess what? On a Saturday or Sunday in the afternoon, boom, there you were on national and then parlaying to international exposure. So it was absolutely fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But, you know, but I, yeah, I agree with you there. I mean, it, it was what it was. And uh, like you say, the, 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 the gentlemen, the, the people involved, I mean, the, the, the staff and you know Tony Garia and Rene Goulet, Arnold Skoland, um, a lot of Alfred Hayes, um, um, you know the the whole Mike McGurd, Howard Finkel, and, and God bless him, uh, uh, Mean Gene Oakland. I mean, I remember sitting in Erie, Pennsylvania, and like you say, you got to be around them long enough that that they 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 took you under their wing, and they would everybody would give, and that's what you did with me, and I appreciate that again. But that's what these people will like there. I mean, Mean Gene Oakland, I am sitting, and I think we talked about this, Maurice. I am sitting in Erie, Pennsylvania, early morning. No one else is up. I am sitting there in a little uh, log cabin. It was called the Log Cabin Cafe, having breakfast. And all of a sudden, Mean Gene comes in. And he goes, uh, Dublin, uh, would you mind if I joined you? And I said, no, of course, sir. Boy, are you kidding me? Mean Gene, he's going to give you gems just chatting. He's going to tell you great stuff. Yeah. So I was sitting there. I was all excited. I'm sitting with Mean Gene Oakland. And I'm sitting there, and and the waitress comes over. I, I had already ordered. And I was like, well, you know, you know these guys better than I do, so you can appreciate it. I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, Mean Gene sits down, and she goes, would you like a menu, sir? And he says, um, no way. I think I'm good. And she goes, can I take your order? Uh, the gentleman's already ordered. And he says, and this is Gene, early morning, six o'clock in the morning in Erie, Pennsylvania. He says, I think I'm going to have the three egg omelet with a side of white toast and an orange juice and black coffee. And I go, Mr. Oakland, do you know that you're announcing your breakfast right now? That's great. But anyway, these are good memories, you know? Yeah. Lord Alfred. I mean, I I actually, you know, I've gotta I've gotta give it again. They let me the name was was cleared. Now we at one point there was nowhere to train because we were training at Gleason's at in Brooklyn, and they had more of the boxing type deal going on there, and they were getting a big push with the boxing at the time. So we were kind of squeezed out. There wasn't room for a wrestling ring in there, all wrestlers. So we were like, well, what do we do? Well, I, everybody kind of scattered. Well, I still wanted to stay up on my stuff and try to figure something out. I, I didn't really know where to turn. And I asked, do you think I could I could go? I know up in the warehouse, up in Stanford, they had where they do all the, you know, they at that point, now it's a big fancy, like it's going to be a museum or something, whatever I saw on TV. But at that point, it was a giant warehouse. And they were... And I they the, were. I, I think the Undertaker just tried to take him. Oh, he's back. The Undertaker got you by the neck first Thanks. match, and so they they. I said, "Do you think it would be okay if I came up there?" Because I knew they had a ring set up in the warehouse where they did all the merchandising, distributing, and I went up there on a Tuesday night. One day, I took a ride, forty-five minute ride, and a forty-five mile ride. I get up there, and I went in, and the lady's sitting there, and. And I said, hi, how are you? I'm Brian Donio, the Dublin Destroyer. And, and I was like, geez, I'm going to have to talk my way in and explain. And the, she goes, oh, yes. And she had me on a list. She goes, yes, um, Mr. McMahon has cleared it. You can come in. I mean, they just don't let anyone walk around their place. I was in there training in a ring by myself. I was using a sweatshirt as an opponent, so I had something to land on, so I have a, a visual. And while I'm there, guys were coming to do their promos and their, their on-air uh, prime time and all that stuff. They were doing their, their tapings. Well, all of a sudden, I'm turning around and Macho Man walks in. 
Then I was in Kevin. All these different guys are coming in and out because I used to go up at least once, twice a week. And these guys would walk in and they go, here, you got to do this with it. Terry Garvin walks in. And then I'm over there. Lot Alfred is giving me gems. He's talking to me. And Sean Mooney was up there because they were doing all the, the spots. And so no matter what, win, lose, or draw, it didn't matter to me because I was, like you said, sir, involved with one of the biggest and best promotions ever in the history of the business. And to me, I won just by being there. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's a hell of a story there. Yeah, true stuff. That's a hell of a story. Yeah. It was great. Someone someone says here, I would have given warehouse, right across from corporate, right? You know, on the other side of the way. I mean, I couldn't find it now, but it's across and then down like a like a, a little windy country. You wouldn't even know it was there, I don't think. It was just right. there were these big buildings, and there I was. And, yeah, they had no problem with me going in there and working out, doing my thing, and, yeah, it was wonderful. But, yeah. Cool. There's two. There's there's two comments in here. Uh, somebody said I would have given Brian Dunhu a title push if I was a booker back in the day. Dude had potential. That's Ian. He's a follower of the show. And oh, one of Mario's that. friends has a question here: The Guardian of Chaos. Can you relay any stories from your days in the UVF? UWF was it Herb Abrams? UWF. UWF yeah, sorry. That's Herb Abrams' group. Yeah, I <laughs> let me tell you. I went. I, I hooked in with with Herb Abrams' group, and they were they were filming for Sports Channel at the um, uh, Penta Hotel right across from the Madison Square Garden. So I went in there, and I, you got to work. There were some big hitters in there. Though. Brian Blair was there, and um, um, uh, Doctor Death was there. I mean, all these guys were there. Morocco showed up. You know, all the so he he was pulling in some quality talent, and um, his. His booker, though, or his his ma match maker, I guess you call the match maker, was his brother in law or something. It was like okay, and Bruno's over there, and Greg Valentine was there, and and Bruno's over there, and I look, and the and the brother in law is talking to me, and and nice man, I'm not doubting anyone, but he, I don't think he quite knew. It wasn't Renee, and it wasn't you know Scullin, and it wasn't no Patterson, and it wasn't these guys. You know they were trying to figure it out. But they had the money to do it, but you know it, it was more. You know this isn't a hobby type thing. Well, you know from doing your own promotions and doing your right. own school, you, gotta, you, know, you, you gotta, gotta know you gotta have years in psychology. Psychology. Yeah. They were. It was just chaos. Who was going with who? But again, they were pleasant. And I, I appreciated being there, but it also uh, worked with um, uh, ICW, Tony Atlas, but I said with the Savoldis, is that I see them up in, and, and I remember them talking to me at, a, at one of these, like I said, these smaller matches at one of these high schools. And one of them was there and he said, I want to bring you up to, um, we were up in, oh, well, I have to go like that. One of the, um, um, what's it called? Sleepy Hollow, the Austin or the Sleepy Hollow, the Headless Hossman. And they brought me in there. Well, my first match was going to be a title match against Tony for the heavyweight championship of the world. Well, I get in, and Savoldi, one of the, I think it was Tommy, he's in the ring as the ref with a cigarette. And I was like, where am I? And he goes, how are you doing, kid? And I go, good, how are you doing? He's on the mic. I go, this is a crazy place. And uh, yeah, Tony, yeah, uh, it worked with him and he ends up giving me the bulldog and boom, busted. I think I broke my nose that night, whatever. It is what it is. But I mean, just interesting experiences. But you know what? I chalked those all up to what they were experiences. And, um, but you know, I mean, again, going back to it, um, WWF, I mean, I, you know, it wasn't going to get better than that. And it was what it was. And, Getting a push, not getting a push, you know. I mean, they actually had me out there, you know, They in Canada, in Cornwall, Canada. They had me out there, and they brought some kid in, and, you know, one of the one of the jobbers, just, you know, same as me, and brought him in, and I was going to go over, and they just, wait, well, dark match, and they were going to show me. Well, at that point, I was working with a gentleman called Bobby Bold Eagle over, and um, we were shooting, uh, we were, um, we were back in the ring over in the Lower East Side, over in the basically projects, but we we're in the cellar. It was a boys' club, but they had a ring set up for boxing and wrestling. And Bobby uh, Cortez, Bobby Bold Eagle, he had worked with WWF for years back in the 70s and 80s. And 
um, they would they were showing me they were lucha libre. They were showing me to do more high flying, and and they were teaching me how to climb the the turnbuckle from the outside without using my hands. With a, and I was going to do what I called the shamrock. And the shamrock, going with the Irish theme, was going to be my opponents down. I do a uh, Japanese suplex. I got the guy. Boom, boom, boom. I got him up on my back. I do a front roll, a front flip. He lands up facing, you know, his feet are facing a corner. I climb the turnbuckle and do a front flip into an elbow. That was going to be the shamrock. Well, needless to say, sometimes it's hit or miss or maybe a bounce or whatever. But I landed it that night. And Bret Hart came to me uh, the next morning. He said, did uh, Vince offer you a um, spot contract? And I said, no. I said, you know, but, you know, I appreciate that they brought me. And he goes, yeah. And Mr. McMahon walked by, and it was him and Owen and um, I want to say Kerry Von Eric standing, and they said, "Wait, well, hey, Vince!" Like they didn't say "give me," but they pointed, like, like you know, like, like Vince, what's up? And he, he seemed to—I don't think he liked that—that that they were, you know, it's it's all his deal, it's his party, so you have to kind of respect that and kind of whatever way it panned out, it panned out. But at least I. I felt like there was a shot at something, but you know what? It already was something, and 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 I get that. And from listening to you talk, I, it made sense that okay, yeah, I was right. It's it, it's you know, I mean, I wouldn't be sitting here with you guys right now if I got you know pissy and said, oh, I don't know, they're not giving me a push, they're not giving me nothing. I'm not doing it, you know, a few hundred here, a few hundred, you know, whatever. But it wasn't really about the money. It was about the. Um, the experience of it and actually, um, you know, progressing in it and learning. Like I said, I was green, but I was learning as I went. And the boys would give me some stuff. They let me work. They let me pound away. They let me, you know, and, and, and at some points I wasn't quite knowledgeable enough or wasn't, I didn't have my skill set all the way there when I first started. So these guys would give me openings and they're like, come on. And, Sometimes I wouldn't know quite, you know, how much to give, or how much to do, or what, what, how much I could get away with doing with them. I mean, Snooker, Jimmy, freaking Superfly Snooker. I mean, he's a freaking legacy, and he, he says to me, "I'm going to put on, you know, left knee pad when I go for the right one, sneak attack me, work me." And he was letting me, I mean, I pounded him 15 times before he even started to come back on me. And it was, you know, that's great stuff. And as I'm hitting him, I'm going, Jesus Christ, Jimmy Superfly Snooker, this is outstanding. That was a good but, thing about heel. Yeah, you know, yeah. yeah you can, yeah. You know, heel, like, like Maurice today, he's like, oh, he worked with a lot of people you work with. I'm like, no, he didn't. <laughs> because yeah, you were yeah. a heel. I was a baby face. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. You know, what I mean? so, uh, you know, I worked with Brett. I worked, uh, I worked with Earthquake, uh, but those are about the only two people that right. that you worked right. with that I worked with. But um, right. right, that was the great thing about being a heel, man. You always right. got, you always got something because that's what, that's what would get well, um, the the baby face over. Yeah, yep. you know, you know, Mario. I'll tell you, in Mario's, I. I, I remember them saying, I remember it was um, Gorilla and um, Vince. They were all sitting like at the table in the Gorilla position. And they're sitting there talking. And they said, now you're going to, you know, you're going to be a, you know, you're going to be a, um, a baby face. We want you to be a good guy. We want you to, you know. Well, I went out and the people started yelling right away. Like yelling at, I don't know if they, but it was, you know, I had never played. In football, I played in front of 100,000 people. In this, I played in front of 20. 30 people, 50 people, you know what I'm scattered. People are, people are, you know, um, talking to each other, not even looking at the ring. You know, I had played that. Now all of a sudden you're in a place with 11, 12, 13,000, whatever it was, 12, 10,000 plus everywhere, no matter what. And all of a sudden they're going berserk. And it, it's only you, you and the ref. Here we come. And they started throwing stuff and yelling, oh, right away, I'm playing and I'm pointing and i'm gonna kill someone i'm doing and they go all right that changed okay you're a heel because you, you like you like to play off them you like to go at them you like to attack i said yeah that's it but uh yeah but that was fun 
There's a lot of questions coming in here for you. I don't know if you remember oh. this one. Mem memories on the 40-man battle royal. That was I just on glanced down. Portfolio. I saw 40-man 40, yeah. 40 battle royal. Yeah, that was Ottawa, Canada. And that was, um, yeah, that was, um, I remember them them explaining to me how that worked because I quite, you know, I have been, these shows I did. We never had, we well, I don't think anyone had a 40-man battle royal but I had never done a battle royal. And they're like, you know, as you go out, blah, 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 and they're explaining how it worked. And I'm, okay, well, I'm coming out there, you know, and all of a sudden, the British Bulldog, blah, 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 blah. You're hearing the names, all of a sudden, the Dublin Destroyer, and blah, blah, blah. And Lord Alfred, because I think he had taken a liking him and John Mooney to me up in up in the uh, warehouse when I was working out, and they, they liked me personally, that he just was, he was talking about me over the um, announcements, like it, like it was uh, um, the commentary, like I was winning everything. I was going to be the next word. Oh, there's the Dublin Destroyer. He's looking keen in his Irish, and look at that hair. And he's like, oh, he's looking fit tonight, and he's in it to win it. You know, they kept going. And then two seconds later, uh, Kerry Von Eric launches me over the top rope, and well, that does it. And Sean Mooney says, there goes the Dublin Destroyer, shillelagh and all. <laughs> you know they have fun with it but yeah so it's cool you know hey yeah you you worked with hulk hogan as well i'm sorry mario i'm just saying yeah, he, he worked with hulk hogan not only in the wrestling business but on tv shows as well right. what was he like well i'm gonna tell you he was always a gentleman i always found him to be a um, absolute consummate gentleman and professional when when i was with um uh, wwf uh, my wife and daughter, uh, we were down in Texas, and we went to um, do a little mini tour down there. We went to uh, uh, Corpus Christi, San Antonio, Austin, Texas, where I had you know played football down there. That was cool. But anyway, we're we're in San Antonio, and we're outside the hotel, and my daughter was four or five then, and so we've got pictures of Hulk holding up just whatever. But when we went to um, um, one of the arenas, I, I think it was. Um, I think it was, it must have been, I say Corp, not Corp, uh, San Antonio, I think, that night. We're there, and my daughter and wife are uh, backstage with me. And like I said, my daughter was about five, four or five years old. And Hulk is talking to us. And he's like, hey there, how you doing, Jess? You know, you know, how you doing, kid? You know, hi, Lori, how are you? And pleasure to see you again, you know. And all of a sudden, they're getting ready. They go, okay, Hulk, 20 seconds. And we're near the curtain. All of a sudden, they, like, he was ready to come out, and all of a sudden, boom, 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 they play the music, and all of a sudden, gotta go. I'll see you later. And all of a sudden, boom, and that crap. I mean, my wife still remarks about this today, and this was thirty plus years later. How it felt like the place was going to collapse on top of us, you and Mari. I mean, come on, it, it doesn't get better than that. Arena yeah. shocks. Oh yeah, you yeah. were bouncing and you were underneath yeah. in the concourse, mm. but. When I went down after WWF, I, I ended up going down. I've been doing some acting, some TV shows, different thing, commercial stuff. And I ended up going down. I got a, um, a contract with Walt Disney World. And I went down there. Yeah, for, I just, you know, the Indiana Jones live show, theme park, whatever. But when I was down there, there were all these stunt people living there. And uh, some of the guys from Stunts Unlimited had, had moved there. Then Hulk Hogan came in with a... TV series, Thunder in Paradise. And so originally they brought me in and they they had me read for some parts, whatever. But then they they didn't know who they were putting where and who was getting cast in what episodes. Whatever. So they said, would you be interested to get it going just to initiate it? Uh, we're going to be doing the pilot in St. Petersburg, which is probably an hour and a half, I think, away in Tampa, away from uh, Orlando, where I was at Disney. So I talked to Disney and said, yeah, go, that's fine, for a couple of weeks to, to be Hulk's stand-in and possibly photo double. But they wanted me to go there. But it was a great move because I got in there and I'm hanging out with Hulk and Brutus was there and Jimmy Hart and everybody, all the old school guys, um, Jimmy the Anvil Neidhart. So we went and we hung out and I ended up doing some stunts for the giant Gonzalez, who was what, almost eight feet tall. And they have, they have pictures of him and me together. And uh, would you know, I've got the fake beard and the hair like him, whatever. I looked like his kid, <laughs> like, but he was just so I was up to like his way, I was up to maybe his ribs. I mean, he was a big dude, but anyway, worked with Hulk, ended up doing 
uh, I think seven episodes out of, you know, um, out of the, maybe more, uh, but playing everything from a, a biker to a, a Moroccan prison guard. They have me all wrapped up so you couldn't see my face again. And um, just, uh, yeah, playing these characters with him. So I got to do that. And yeah, it was wonderful and cool stuff. But he, he was wow. a gentleman. There's like great experiences, man. Good for you. It was fantastic, Mario. It was great. Yeah, man. Good for you. Thanks, brother. Yeah. It's fantastic. Thank you. I'm sure you might have something to add, Mario. Well, something listen, you... uh, again, um, in the in the mid '80s, it, it was um, it was a lot different. Like, it, what amazes me is, you know, being in the ring with McGurk and yep. and her actually clearing the Dublin Destroyer. Yep. You know, and and here I am. You know what I mean? In 1985, yeah, with a pair of trunks that are the Italian flag, right, right. And Pat Patterson tells me I can't wear those out there. Really, really. Well, the Sheik, the Sheik complained like a little baby that those those were the Iranian colors. Uh, no. Called Pat over, and Pat he goes, ah, ah, Mancini, Mancini. He's those are Sheiky scholars. And Pat said, "Yeah, I can't wear them out there." Wow, <coughs> amazing, huh? In in '84 in house shows, I throw I I got the little packs of M and M. I throw the M and Ms out to the crowd. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, you know we're gonna get sued if somebody chokes on them. You, you can't, you can't. Uh, wow, you know because I was thinking about being a, the because I was only 18. I was gonna yeah. be like the M and M kid, right? Yeah, yeah. Can't throw somebody chokes, we'll get sued, and and we have no permission from you know. Um, <laughs> I had the idea of being Super Mario Mancini with the hat, the tool yeah. belt. Yeah, that works. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we have to pay Nintendo, we can't do that. And Jesus sometimes I have to wonder so, if so I was like, a, so it was a well, it was a different time, I guess, because obviously, I mean, I'm in the ring, I'm in the ring, and I said. Um, the, I, I mean, she covered a mic. I go, Mike, Mike, I'm doing like a Ventura. Mike, this is in front of 10,000 people. I go, I'm the Dublin Destroyer tonight. And she goes, you the what? Fucky, what are you talking about? I go, I'm the, the, and I turned and I pointed. And she goes, is that, is this cleared? Who? No one told me that. She goes, I don't have any of that on my stuff. I don't have that on here. I, I go, I know. She goes, I got Brian Donnie. I said, yeah, but I'd like to be called that. And she went over to the ringside, whoever she was talking to, and they buzzed in, whatever, whoever had to say yes or no. And uh, that was it. And you got him, you got him by surprise that night, I think. If you and they say, you know what? Someone said, give it to him, go. And that was yeah. it. I, I was surprised. I said, all right, this is going to be a, all right, here he is, Brian Donnie. And that's it with his mullet. And we're done. No. And they, and it kept going. They let me, you know, and that was it. Yeah. It could have been your size, man, because like I said, you're a big dude. So um I think the guys will let me get a little more on them. Maybe they, you know, maybe it balanced out. But I guess, you know, maybe, maybe because I never I never pushed or squeezed them for any, I never asked for anything. So I think they respected the fact that I was in it. I was willing to take any hit over the rope. I went whatever we gotta do, we gotta do it. We'll do it. Well, and well I, you there was only one guy I used to complain to all the time, and that was Strongbow. I mean, we pro we would privately have arguments. Of course, yeah. You know, especially when I I, I walked into the dressing room one, one night, and a, a, one particular gentleman had a torn Yankee sweatshirt on, a hat, and a cigar. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. Where's the, you're worried about my colors on my trunks, right? Where's Bro my where's Broken brawler? Yeah. Where's my where's my gimmick? You know what I mean? Where's yeah, you know what I mean. You go you, within a week. You go from a job, and you're over. Yeah. All this, you're over. I mean, that's what I was. I mean, to to me, to me, it just it just makes it that much better. It's something, you know. It's yeah. something there. It, it's visually. It's a visual thing. It's it's you know. It's like yeah, someone people can go yeah, look at that. Yeah, the right. Irish guy or the the Italian right. guy or the the right. you know, like you said, Mario Brothers. So, you know what, whatever it is, you know. Right. Just, Right. There's something there. I remember guys. How about guys that 
that weren't exactly excited about their gimmicks. And, and, and I remember um, um, Dasso, was it um, uh, Repo Man? I don't think he liked his thing. His I remember him dragging his freaking hook and his rope behind him, shaking his head at me. I go, what's wrong? He goes, look at it. Look, I look like the hamburger with the thing. Uh, yeah. Some of the guys didn't like doing, you know, it's like they let, let us come up with something ourselves and, you know, but I'm sure they did. But again, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's someone else's house and you're invited to the party, but you're, you're going to obey the rules of the house and that's it. So I, I got that. Yeah. But no. Yeah. But I know you, you walk in and you see people with a gimmick and it's like, you know, I'm not asking well, for the, the, the thing is, is you the, probably could have come up with 50 different things. Well, when I, when I was in wrestling school in 83, you know, the, 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 the thing that was told us were, you know, pay your dues. Sure. You know what I mean? Do what you have to do and pay your dues. Right. right. Do the right thing. And you'll, yeah. you'll get a push. Sure. But then, yeah. Push out the door. Yeah. <laughs> Where are you getting pushed to? I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The push. Get out. Uh, yeah. Push. Yeah. The I push. So. There's a question there. How was Macho Man and Elizabeth towards you? They they were absolutely fantastic. Let me tell you, we have pitches with them at one of the shows, and um, my daughter with Macho Man and Liz and the hugging her, and there's a belt there, or whatever. But um, uh, I mean, he he was always very very uh, pleasant. He was to me. He was very pleasant to me. And Elizabeth was absolutely. I mean, she was gorgeous, and she was just just sweet she she had a good heart she's a southern girl you know she she had an uh, eloquence about her and uh yeah and that that was kind of you know that was kind of sad that they had split and you know and you know my wife says to me you know sometimes you're she thinks i'm like in 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 um enamored or infatuated with with um people dying in our game well you can't help it I can't help it. I you look up and all of a sudden, boom! Except the ones you see on the news, boom! This one pops, this one pops, and you see this one passed away at this age. With well, then you start looking, looking up. People go down that list. Go on IMDb. Go on one of these uh, wrestling lists and go down from the years you were there, especially all those years. You go down that roster, and it's like, my God, gone, gone. You know gone. these guys. I literally brought me to my knees. I mean, I was, you know, the two people in particular would be Bundy mm -hmm. and, Strong, and Strongbow. Yeah, uh, I, I can imagine. Yeah. yeah so, it, you know, because um, I was really close to Chris and um, that one hurt. I mean, uh, I'm glad Tony Atlas is doing well because he's he's another one of my brothers. And Yep, yep. And Val he, he was a gentleman. I liked him. He you know, it's funny because, you know, everybody has their troubles. Everybody has their their um, problems in life and different things. And I'm not singling him out. But, you know, a lot of people have troubles. But, you know, it's um, I remember um, after. Uh, oh, just a, an example. My wife, my my wife says, hey, look, she goes, this popped up on my phone or whatever, because we're on Long Island here. And it said that. Um, um, oh, geez. I'm gonna believe, uh, Lanny Poffo was going to be at the, um, at um, you know, the memorabilia, well, you know, because you do the memorabilia store here in um, Long Island, and, and it was only 10 minutes from here, 15 minutes, and this was on a Wednesday, and she goes, he's going to be there Friday night at like 6 to 8. She goes, we should go, and he stayed at my mom's house in Boston, and when he was, we were traveling, and he, my family was out of Boston, and he was going, he had, to, he was on a phone or a pay phone or something. And I go, you all right? Do you need something? And he goes, no, dude. He goes, I got to get, you know, he's very mellow. He goes, I got to, I'm trying to, I got to get a rent a car. I got to get a, um, in a hotel and I got to get to the airport because I got to get to Logan airport. I'm flying to another uh, region tomorrow. And I got to, you know, it's just crazy. And I'm just trying to figure it out. And I'm trying to take notes and the pay phones and whatever. I said, well, where, where do you got to go? And he goes, I got to go to the airport. I go, when? I go, do you want to, do you mind staying in a regular house tonight? 
and we took them home. And he sat there. We got my family up in Boston. We had Chinese food and pizza because we don't discriminate. We were eating. He goes, do you do this a lot? I go, yeah, that's what we, my sister don't like Chinese food. That one don't like pizza. So we come by. Anyway, but back to the story, my my brother sends me a text and it was an obituary or a, or a, not obituary, but at that point, but it was, you know, saying how uh, Lanny Poffo uh, died and we, like that Thursday, this Wednesday, we're talking about going and seeing him. And then Thursday, he's gone. I couldn't, yeah, I couldn't even show the night before. Yep. He like, the show. Yeah. And that was it. He was done. And it, but how many guys? I mean, I'm talking like when I was there, 30 guys minimum and and sherry and elizabeth and lot alfred and this you know I, i'm afraid to look people up now i'm not going to look you out <laughs> oh <laughs> well you know it's funny because i talk to people when when um back from the from the days and sometimes i'll talk to people when i disney or whatever i'll touch base or they'll come and they stun people so they'll show up on a set in new york and all of a sudden they see me and they're like you're still alive and i go yeah but you know just a, a lifestyle different you know it's a but you know the bumps and bruises they take a toll on you too i mean oh. you, thank you yeah i mean you know it's a and people don't oh. realize people say well how can guys have this or cte or this or this or that i said because your body is getting jarred how many hit how many bumps have you taken oh. i've taken an enormous amount but you quadruple me minimum every morning man every morning it's 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 a, it's and i have people texting me and you know um in the morning and i'm like they're like are you okay i go look man i just need some time yeah you know what i mean so, you can't so, move in a little bit that's don't, you don't. yeah that would be me with the time difference texting them yeah i was like um the one thing that um um impressed about and envious at the same time as you refer to your wife yes um when you were working yeah and you refer to your wife now yeah well yeah and, and that i that's all i tried to accomplish and i couldn't i couldn't get it done i i took three whacks at it and i just all right that but couldn't you know, i really i if if i had well i got married in 86. yeah us, when, we, us too yeah I was 20. Yeah. You know, but mine lasted a whopping 11 months. All and right. then I got married again in, in 93. I started dating her in 90 and I brought her to the arena. And at the time, uh, my daughter, who I adopted when she was seven, she's, she's 36 now, wow. <laughs> but um, yeah. she was four years old. So they're standing, they're standing downstairs, you know, across from the blue curtain. That okay. you, you know what I mean before you go into the dressing room. Yep, yep. Uh, because Maurice, there was a blue curtain, and then you go through the blue curtain, and there were doors to the dressing room. Yeah, okay. And a hallway, you know, so you couldn't regular people couldn't go beyond. A, she was outside the blue curtain. Right. And Strongbow came out, and I said hello to him and everything, and we went beyond the blue curtain, behind the blue curtain. He goes, "Who is that?" Yeah. I said, "That's my girlfriend." He goes, "Is that?" your daughter i go no that's that's her daughter i love that little kid he goes what do you want to get in a jackpot for he goes get rid of her i go what he goes get rid of her i go no chief i love her i'm not he goes me and seeing get rid of her i go no chief i'm not <laughs> get rid of her he says get rid of her but man i i listen you that 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 you know i look up to you a lot for that because listen Sunny, Sunny Blaze, all right, Sunny Blaze. He says, "Listen, they want you to come up. They want you to come up to." Um, he was talking to Gavin. They want you to come up to the um, to corporate up on, on the expressway there. That's the only way I knew where it was. You see it when you drive up there, right? And I see the big WW, WWF then, not WWE, WWF, old school. And they want you to come up. And this was, um, uh, I said, "Why are we going up?" And he said, "Yeah, and Laurie and Jess too." I said, okay, that, that could be a good thing. But I didn't realize the, the, the way things go. We went up. We didn't meet with Vince. We we met with Linda. We were sitting in Linda McMahon's office. 
I didn't even know what was going on. I didn't know. It's strange, right? We're sitting there, and then we went, and we had lunch there in the cafeteria with her, and it was like, I don't know what. And I, I, I don't know. I think it, maybe she was feeling us out as a family, whatever. The, because it's a rough road, I think, for families, for relationship. I think, I mean, I, that's, that's, that's what I can surmise. But, I mean, well, they just wanted to bring us up for lunch, but it was different. I mean, I, I didn't know what. I tell you, Maurice, all these guests that you have, yeah. I, I, I am not convinced that I was the farthest away from the office as dealing with the office any wrestler has ever been in the history of wrestling. I mean, I listen, I used to hang. I'll tell you when I used to go to the office, when George Scott was the booker before Pat Patterson. Wow. Before Pat. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 84, yeah. five. I used to, I used to hang around the office. I yeah, used to, yeah. I used to talk to Ed Cohen and all those guys, <laughs> you know, but, uh, yeah. I was never invited there. I would just hit the button. And go, to this, to this day, I mean, I haven't talked to Sonny in I don't know how many years. But I never asked. I never even asked. What was I doing? It. Why did we? Why? Because we didn't say, "Can we come?" And I want to show my wife your plan. I would never. Did, I don't, did Sonny what? tell you how he got there? Huh? Did Sonny tell you how he got there? How he got there? Yeah. No, I don't know. I. I, all I know is that he said, "Do you want to work WWF?" Do I want to know? So yeah, you do. So okay. Maurice does. Maurice, it, like, eh. so it's, it's eighty nine. Yep. And Tony Altamar, the guy that trained me, comes up right, to me. Sure, of course. He goes, uh, "You want to do three days with Savoldi?" I go, "No." Yeah. yeah. I don't. Yeah. He goes up in Maine. I go, no, I don't. He goes, why not? I go, I, I don't want to. Right. I go, listen, the only reason why you want me to go is because you'll fall asleep driving. I go, I don't. Yeah. yeah. He goes, come on, kid. Throws you the keys. Yeah. He goes, come on, kid. I said, all right, Tony. I'm not doing any jobs for anyone. Right. Not. Right. Won't do it. Right. So I go, hold on. We're in the gym. Where I go, hold on. So I call the office. I go, let me talk to Terry Garvin. Yep. So he gets on the phone. Hey, Mario Quesadilla. He goes, yeah, he always said that to me. Mario Quesadilla. He was a, I liked him a lot. Yeah, he was a good guy. Yep. He was. So I go, Terry, can I do three days for Savoli up in Maine? I go, I don't want to get in trouble. He goes, yeah, yeah, you go ahead and do that. You could do that. So I go up there, and Savoldi comes up to me. He goes, will you do a job for I and Mike Sharp? I went, Mike Sharp? All day long. Different world. Yeah, 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 yeah. All day ah, long. Yeah. Let me tell you. I go, right. let me tell you something. Mike and I tear it up. We did a lot of house shows together. We That's tear it up. Outstanding, yeah. I said, not a problem. Yeah. He goes, okay, thanks. I appreciate it. No problem. I, so I, you know, go over, hug Mike. I go, sure, just like the old days. Of course. So then the second night, he put me with Sonny Blaze. And uh, <laughs> yeah. So Sonny goes, you, what do you want to do for a finish? I go, oh, you know, I'll, I'll catch you off guard with a, a sidewalk slam. Okay. And um, we go. He's eighteen years old. We go back to the dressing room. And you know, I shake his hand to hug him. Thank you very much. Yep, yep, and, uh, yep. He goes, That was really good. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. He goes, It was really good considering that I, I broke my neck. I went, When that night? You broke your With neck? You? No, no, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like, Get out. You were there with a broken, you just re recovered from a broken neck and you went in there. Are you out of your mind? He goes, Yeah, well. You know, and then we're talking a little bit, and he's like, "Yeah, my mother just passed away," and I'm like, Ugh. "I go, you want to go to TV?" He goes, "What?" I go, "You want to go to TV?" He goes, "You can get me in the TV." I go, "Go yeah, as long as I vouch for you, I can," right. because at that point, I was bringing people, I was training people, I was bringing them to the TV, like Mark Thomas and stuff, and and <laughs> yep. Rothenberg and those guys, and. Pat Patterson would actually look at people, and go, 
who trained you. It yep. was either Walter Kowalski, um, uh, Larry Sharp, or me. Right. And if it was right, one right. of the three people, they'd go, okay, get, get dressed. Yeah. So I go, do you, you want to go to TV? And he went, yeah. okay. And I, I brought him the TV. Wow, that's great. <laughs> the rest, the so rest you, is, so the you, rest basically, is, Maurice, it's full circle because that means you brought me. That, because yeah, Sonny well, talked to Gavin and brought me. So yeah, yeah, it was. Thank it, you. It, it, and he got really <laughs> close to that. He got really close to Garvin yep. in a in, in a man to man traditional way. Good. You know, there was a, a genuine likeness as a person. No, oh. thank you there. Okay. Oh, as, as my memory serves me right, Garvin ended up giving him a ring, and Sonny made a hell of a living with that ring. Wow. Yeah, leasing it out and everything, going all yeah. over right now. So, yeah. um, I Sonny oh, Blaze. Okay. When you said he gave him a ring, I got confused for a second. I was like, what? No, no, he gave him a wrestling okay. ring. Okay, wrestling ring. Maurice. Yeah. Right, yeah. Sonny Blaze is one of my favorite people, man. He really is. I love Sonny. I love yeah, Sonny. He, 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 when when we first went there, I remember my first match was uh, the British Bulldog. We're in the Worcester Center. I'm needless to say, the crowd's going nuts, the whole thing. And I went in and did a good job, vertical soup, the whole thing. And I saw what he, you know, I did what I could do with it. And, but I, I wasn't afraid to take any hit he was going to throw at me, any bump. So it worked out nice. And, but, um, I remember, um, as we went on, as we moved on, he he would say, "Listen, he goes, the um, Gavin wants to go here. We're gonna go here. We're gonna go here. great." So we kept going, and um, I remember when he first introduced me to you, or he said, "He goes, that's Mario Mancini. He goes, he's got a lot of years, you know, in. He knows his way around. So if you have any questions, go to him and ask him. He'll tell you what's what." And this, and he said that. Um, he he did say it to me that he was instrumental in helping us get here. So I said, yeah, and I went over and introduced myself, and and um, but he, yeah, so he did, he did give you that respect. I know he did, yeah. So that's yeah, it, it was it, he. He was a he was a good kid, he and he said you would bring your group up from Connecticut or where, and then we'd come from here, and they go from here. That's, he goes, yeah, that's, but it's not a he goes not a competition thing. He goes just try to get better yourself, and he goes and Mario will tell you the same thing. Just try to get better yourself and. And he goes, he goes, you'll find that people genuinely, because we're all kind of in the same boat. We all want to, you have more experience, but you know, you've been around longer, but we, you know, we genuinely want each other to do well. And the ideally for everyone to get a little something, a little push, because we know, we know what the game is. We, we know what, what we, we knew our spot. I knew my spot and I was because, good with that. Hi Maurice, everything he says is true. You know why? Because. You don't know. You don't know. You you have no idea. So you're always respectful. You're always gracious. You're always humble because Donahue could have beat Hogan for the strap. Right. There I am getting a pile driver or, or doing a job for the Undertaker. And yep. all yep. of a sudden he turns around and goes, you know, Mario, Blaze told me that you brought him. He brought me. Yeah, yeah I, I want to give you a little payback for that. So I'm going to talk to Vince. You never know, right? Who's who's going to do what? Who's going to who and how it's going to right so itself you, around? You, yep. You want to be kind it, it, to everyone, right? And you want to root for everyone. I remember, I remember fighting with Strongbow, and I was young. I was a year in. Yep. Joe Erdo picked up his bag. He had tears. See you later, Mario. Saying yeah. goodbye. There you go. Where are you going, Joe? Strongbow cut me. I go, what? He was done. He was gone. He goes, Strongbow let me go. I go, why? He goes, because he said I'm too old. So I go running up. He leaves. I go running up. This, I go, chief, what you do to Joe? Mind, yeah. your business. Mind your business, kid. Got it. I go, oh, he's a nice guy. Room with them. I go, I've been on the road with them. I go, chief. Joe Myrtle's a classic. Mancini, sit your ass down and mind your own business. Yeah. I go, Chief, I go, Chief, this this is wrong. This sucks. He yep. goes, You want to be next? I go, no, I don't. He goes, then yep. sit down. 
better. Yeah, just mind your own deal. Yeah, I you know. What I mean? So it, it, you know, uh, but you're a straight shooter, so you want to you want to back up your friend. I, I got it. I, I, Wes Thornton and I tried to talk David San Martino till we blew in the face. Blue in the face. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. You went right up to Vince McMahon. I saw the hands flying and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. Picked up his bag. He went, see you later. Never saw him again. Yeah. He had Never a, he, saw him again. He, he, was, he was in the, uh, wasn't he in, uh, did he end up with UWF? He did. I think everybody. I, think I ran into, everyone ended up there. They're right. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I, I think we, We'll have to kind of wrap it up here at this point, but I think we need to uh, get you gentlemen back on again, hopefully at some Any, point. Any time with you guys. Absolutely. Yeah. No yeah well, so, uh, Brian, where can people kind of follow you or your work then if they want to have a look at what you're up to keep on tabs? You you could just, I mean, I have it pretty clear and concise. You can, you could just look up my name, Brian Donio actor, and my stuff is all over there. And IMDB, the International Movie Database, and um, you know one thing after another: the documentary, the guy, the Brian Donahue story. There it is. Mm -hmm. I can scan that. Where is it? I can't do it. Look at me covering on my finger. There's the little QR thing. codes and everything. This guy is really on the ball, Mario. QR. Yeah, well, codes. that's that's my wife. Well, well, I, Brian, I, what is it? I said, I said to the. I said to someone, I gave him someone in California, I go, here, my wife put on the OR code. You know, operating room, what's an OR code? I go, this. They go, QR? I go, okay. Yeah, that's it. I don't know. Gentlemen, it was an absolute pleasure. Um, I tell you, I, I'm 66 pages um, into a oh, screenplay yeah. that I've, I've avoided for a while. Um, oh, I'm up to I am up to 1993 on it. I, I got 30 more years to go, but um, right. if we can, if we can hook up and you can tell me, direct me where I can contact somebody to try to no. sell this thing, I'll be more than happy to cast your part in the movie. There you go. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's know whatever, whatever you need to do. Let's say, yeah, I can help. We can help you. Terrific. Absolutely. Terrific. No, no problem. Anything you need. Absolutely. I, I appreciate it, man. Thank All you. Right, guys. Of course. Love. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much, guys. You Appreciate you both. Appreciate right. you. Thank All you. Right. Okay.